So, yeah, we have people joining now. Awesome. Uh, but, hey, a lot of people who join in. Recording in progress. Um, this, a monitor. There you go. We're just waiting to get to the top of the hour for everyone to be able to join. So, hey, Rosa, you're already on the chat. Where are you coming from? This list is getting larger and larger. Yeah. Start heating up the chats. Hey, hi from Tunisia. Hi from Mexico. How are you? Hey, Patrick. A lot of people coming from Africa. Yeah. It's a good time for this talk to in Africa, right? Okay. And we're just waiting for more people to connect. And at 10, well, exactly the top of the hour, uh, we just get started for just to make sure we, we get on time. So welcome to our December Andela webinar, the journey from software engineer to founder with James Welton. But before we begin, I just want to do some housekeeping regarding our community guidelines. First, treat others as you would treat them in real life. Be tolerant towards others' point of view and respectfully disagree when opinions do that align. Respect the privacy and personal information of other members and participants. <clears throat> Always communicate with courtesy and respect. Do not make personal attacks on other community members or use defamatory remark or make false statements against others. Do not post prejudice comments or profanity and do not bully or make inflammatory remarks to other community members. Any of those cases will not be tolerated and immediate action will be taken. Please report any behavior of this type. Having said that, please use the chat tool down below to engage with other community members like you or engage in a conversation with Dan and Dylan. We will be very happy to assist you. We encourage you to use the Q&A tools for questions to our speakers. We will try to address all of them. And please do not forget to visit andela.com. Click on the upper right corner button and join Andela to get one step closer to finding your next role, advancing your career, and connecting with other talented engineers in our community. We are connecting brilliance with opportunity. Now, I'm going to pass the microphone to Rosa Lehammer. She is Andela's Head of Talent Experience and will be our host for today. Thank you very much. It's all yours now. Thanks, Oscar. That's great. Uh, welcome, everybody, to our latest Andela workshop. Really excited for this one, uh, not only because I know our guest very well, um, but also I think his story and journey will really be uh, fantastic for you guys to hear. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Rosa. As Oscar said, I'm the head of talent experience uh, for Andela. What that means is that I support and speak to talent every day, uh, making sure that your journey with Andela is amazing and awesome. Uh, but yeah, today I get the special honor of hosting this panel, and I'm really excited for all of your questions uh, with our amazing guest, James. So about James, uh, James, James is joining from Dublin. Uh, he is a founder and consultant, has worn many hats over the years, which I'm really excited for him to tell us about today. Um, I had the absolute honor of working with James on his first ever venture called Coder Dojo, which is a global movement decoding clubs uh, for kids all over the world. Um, and every time I speak with James, I'm really, really impressed by what he has to say, what he's sharing and what he's learning um, and how he's applying that to both his personal life, but also his professional life um, and how he's impacting the world as well. And so I really wanted him to bring bring him on and meet some Mandelans because uh, I think that his story and journey could, I guess, like 
bring some questions about for you and maybe you'll learn something from it too. Um, so really honored to have you, James. Thank you and welcome to Andela. Um, yeah, um, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thank you so much. That's great, Rosa. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. I'll, uh, why, are you the, why are you the money later? So um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, my name is, is James. Um, we're gonna play a game today to see if my camera doesn't stop working uh, during this thing. If it does, I mean, I'll just uh, I'll switch over to my other camera. But I'm just going to call that out so it's it's less embarrassing if it happens. Um, so I'm going to talk about a, a few things today, and and um, I'm really delighted to have been invited here to to get to talk. Um, but I just wanted to like start off by like stating up front that I've had a very strange path. Um, so I I didn't go to college after secondary school by accident, uh, ended up starting a, a nonprofit when I was 18, which I had the pleasure of working with Rosa at. Um, at 25, I became the CTO of a large uh, e-commerce company. I've worked for companies in, in many different countries, so Ireland, the US, in, in the Middle East, and in Asia. Um, I've built several companies and products, and most of them have failed. So it could also be a, a good idea not to take some of the advice that I have today. Uh, you might do better than me. Um, but the kind of common thread is that I've found opportunities outside the conventional system. I've also burned out a lot of times. I, I think it's a talent of mine to find new ways to make myself depressed and tired. Um, and I also think like I'm not particularly smart or special. I, I like regularly don't lock the front door of my house. So like I think I've used a lot of systems and, and ways of thinking to find opportunities and, and kind of achieve the things that I've wanted to achieve. Um, so what I'll talk about today is um, my journey uh, and kind of through that highlight how I found opportunities, maybe in novel ways, um, the importance of networking and basically how it's been the most unfair advantage that I've ever had and, and most other people have had, how I've managed burnout in the, let's say, the three major burnouts that I've had in my life, and then kind of the, the journey from going from a software engineer to a founder. And I've made that journey back and forth a few times. And then I think at the end, we'll, we might have like maybe... 10, 15, 20 minutes for Q&A, depending on how badly I do. Uh, or maybe there'll be no questions and we can all go home early, great. <laughs> um, so I think it, it's important to disclaim like two things. The first one is that like, this is my set of experiences. Everybody has different circumstances, different privileges, different backgrounds and so on. So I'm just gonna talk about what my set of experiences have been and, and you can take the good and leave the bad or, or whatever. The other one is that everybody everybody has their own particular path and values. So what might be important and, and uh, valuable to me is not valuable or important to somebody else and vice versa. So generally what I've tried to do is just learn from a bunch of people um, and advise do what works best for you. And the, the times that I've been most unhappy is when I've um, tried to follow somebody else's path or do the things that I, I thought were uh, important or good but actually weren't or important good for me in particular. So just to give, again, some more context, uh, I'm from Cork, Ireland. Um, I'm a full stack developer by trade across a bunch of stacks and technologies and languages, both front end, back end and mobile. Um, I've also tried to become a, a full stack entrepreneur over my career. So like for a while, I was just like the like tech person. Um, but I tried to learn how to like get good at product and design learn how like marketing works, um, the running of companies from like management and, and finance. Um, so I, I've really tried to, to like, yeah, the same way that we, we talk about like full stack in a technology sense, do that, but with like entrepreneurship and business. Um, I co-founded an organization called Coder Roger, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, right now I'm co-founder and CTO of a startup that's based in Japan called Tokyo Mate, which I'll also talk about. And then uh, one of the major things in my life at the moment is uh, a platform called Conjure, which I've been building. And to talk a little bit about Conjure first, um, it's a platform to manage habits, goals, time, and behaviors through data and automation. It's something that I've been wanting to build for years. Um, I've built it across web, iOS, and Android. It's all real time. So you do something on like web or, or mobile and it kind of updates instantaneously. Everyone else it uses a rules engine. It's graph based. It's an OAuth API. I've been building it bootstrapped and self-funded and I've been doing it alone for the last like 16 months. So it was actually like maybe um, like six or seven months before I let the first other person see it. Um, and I don't intend on raising money or anything for it. It's a real passion project and maybe a different approach that I've done previously. It's quite a long journey ahead. Um, so if anyone's interested in like 
seeing all the ups and downs and uh, what it's like to grow a company, get more customers and, and build that product. I share that openly on Twitter. Um, and the premise of building it kind of came from my own experiences and, and research into well-being, happiness and life satisfaction and how you build systems around that. Um, and right now it has paying customers uh, and like an emerging community and it's been pretty exciting. So that's the kind of bigger thing that I've been working on recently. But then going to the other kind of end of my life, um, Coder Rojo is this uh, movement of free programming clubs for young people, uh, which I co-founded when I was 18. Today, it's in over 115 countries and, and over 2,000 clubs. And um, COVID kind of threw a spanner in the works for, for everyone in that. But generally, it, it kind of non-COVID times reaches maybe around like 50 to 60,000 young people um, quite regularly. Um, and it's all free volunteer base. And it's not just for learning how to uh, code, but also like learn how to work in teams, how to present projects, kind of build a number of other complementary skills. So the things that kind of led to, to founding Coder Ojo, um, almost like by accident was that like growing up, like I wasn't a particularly good student in school, I actually had like quite a lot of difficulties with, with the learning and reading and writing early on. Um, but what I did really love was making websites. And I ended up like, oh, there we go. That's the bingo. The uh... <laughs> okay, let's uh, switch camera. See, uh... you had a backup, so that's that's exactly. always the way. See how completely not embarrassing and smooth that was because I I mentioned it at the very beginning. Uh, that's great. Now, if this camera fails, then I'm then we're really in trouble. So it could become a, a podcast, uh, but we'll continue. Um, so I started making websites when I was about nine years old and I, I like, I really loved it. Um, and like, I, I bought books, but I, I wasn't a particularly fast learner. I think it took me like five or six weeks to figure out that, uh, how to embed an image in a web page, And like the image has to be in the same folder as a web page or directory relativity. But I, I just kind of spent time at it. It was very frustrating for me growing up was that I had nowhere to learn this stuff. Um, I had nowhere to make friends who were also really interested in computers and programming or just like a place to show off what I made. So the kids who were like into sports, obviously had sports that they could play. Kids who were in school got recognized for being good in school. I had nowhere to get recognized um, and share what was most important to me, which was like building things. So I kept on like playing around with computers and programming and different languages and hacking and all that stuff um, throughout high school. And then when I was uh, near the end of my high school, I got known for finding an, like a, a really simple or basic exploit and an iPod Nano that came out. Um, people in my school were like, oh, if that idiot James can program, like surely we can too. So um, about 40 students approached me and I started teaching them twice a week after school how to program and just try to do it differently. Like we, we aimed for having fun, like everybody was there for their free time. So if like somebody was like, being annoying we just like kick them out of the club and like you know if somebody couldn't figure out what website to make we'd have a competition for like who could make the worst website so we just try to like do it quite different to school um so uh i was invited to speak a con at a conference while i was in that final year of high school about the experiences of like hacking that ipod nano and my 15 minutes of internet fame um and i met my co-founder bill um and basically i was talking about this coding club i was running and and it was a lot of fun, but I didn't know what was going to happen after I left high school, um, if somebody would keep on running it, and that now students from other schools wanted to come to my school to join this club after their school finished. So Bill saw a lot of things that I, I didn't see. I was maybe 17 at the time or 18. Um, he saw that there was a lot of economic opportunity for developers, that there was a, a huge growth in technology. So we agreed to run one of these coding clubs outside of my school after I finished my school exams. And like, honestly, I had no idea what was going to happen if, if anyone would even show up or anything or like no solid plan. We just said we'd get together for two hours and make uh, websites and games. Um, so what was very surprising was that people came from like three hours from the main city in Ireland, Dublin, to, to my hometown of Cork. And then soon people wanted to set up their own clubs. So we just kind of naturally followed it and we worked on trying to like package it up and, and make it easy for other people to start these clubs. And then for the next three years, um, you know, we were building and growing Kotorojo. We grew to over maybe 300 clubs um, at that point across many countries. We started a foundation with a, with a team of five. But me personally, I was maybe 21 at this point and had been working on it for three years. I didn't know how to manage people. Um, I, a lot of people need to know what success looks like in each direction. And I didn't know how to do that. Uh, I also didn't look after myself. So I just like wasn't sleeping properly, wasn't eating properly, exercising 
crazy work hours. So I became very like stressed and anxious and ultimately became quite depressed and burnt out. And obviously that's not a, a, a fun person to, <laughs> to work with. Um, and I, I really wanted to go back to building and coding. So we hired a new CEO and I took a break to, to figure out what to do in life. Um, and this was the kind of the first time that I've ever been faced with like, well, how do I find like my next opportunity or what do I do next? Because the Coder Oja thing just kind of happened by accident. It happened by like coming out of school and, and I never really had to think about it, but I knew I wanted to build something and, and learn and, and kind of fix my gaps. So I, I you know, I, for me, opportunity is kind of like a funnel. Um, and I think you have to start off with, with having an idea of what success looks like first. So knowing if that's like a particular job, a particular role, particular lifestyle and if you don't know what success looks like you have to go get data points and go and learn and iterate that's kind of what i've done throughout my career today is that i've had an idea of what success looks like try and get learnings to iterate and see what i like and don't like and refine that idea of success so um once you have that idea of success you need to then find the opportunities to realize it um so you take like a, a typical e-commerce uh funnel if you're ultimately trying to sell like a product online the stages of the funnel are awareness where you're going to advertise over Google ads or Facebook ads to try and find maybe the right type of people who would be interested in. The next stage of the funnel is evaluation where the person lands on a landing page. You're going to use the language or, or uh, communications that, that you know, sounds good to them or, or resonates with them. If they're interested, the next step, they might go to the cart and check out. And of course, this funnel is getting like smaller. So people will drop out. Maybe they don't realize that they're, they're not interested until they get to cart or check out, or maybe their circumstances change. You know, turns out they get one for Christmas, so they no longer need this product. Um, but they get to the cart and check out. And then eventually the last step is conversion where they purchase. So for me, opportunities have kind of been the same. That There's been the, the awareness step that instead of running Google ads or Facebook ads, I've just talked to a lot of people and being like, yeah, I'm, I'm looking for a new opportunity or these are the things I'm interested in, or I want to learn how to manage people better. Um, eventually out of maybe 20 of those conversations, one person has a requirement. They're like, oh yeah, actually we, we need a developer or we, that guy I was talking to recently actually have a problem that he can fix or, or work with on and then go and explore that opportunity, see if it's actually a fit. If, um, if, uh, if maybe actually I'm the wrong fit or, or, they're actually super sketchy when I look into it. So it's not a, a, a good fit. And then the last step is obviously conversion or working together. So I'm just kind of go through this funnel and how it's played out in my life and the different things that I've done. So going back to like what happened after Kodorojo, I, I left Kodorojo. I had no idea what was going to happen next. So I just spent time hanging out with uh, software engineers and entrepreneurs and was talking to them that I was looking for something new. I just didn't know what it was. And I actually went through this funnel twice after Kodorojo. The first one was I was offered funding by a venture capitalist to move to America and start a new company. They were kind of like, oh, you know, he did Kodorojo and, you know, clearly he'll, he'll do something like successful and uh, <laughs> which is really far from the truth. So I explored it. You know, they, they heard about me, obviously their requirements. The second stage of that funnel is that they need to, to fund people. And then that third stage of the funnel, we explored the opportunity and I decided it, it wasn't a fit. I felt that I'd run into the exact same problems again and not knowing how to manage people. I also felt that it'd be good to work on something that belonged to somebody else and wasn't my baby because obviously I had issues with anxiety and stress that I needed to sort out first. Um, and I felt that I should get experience and learning from like a more structured environment. So ultimately didn't go ahead with that, went back to talking to people and now I had a better idea of what I needed. I said, okay, I need to, to work with, with somebody in a role where I can learn to manage people, but also you know, build product and, and learn processes. So talk to a bunch of people. Then eventually after a few months, um, I met a, through a connection, I, I met an entrepreneur who had a company in Dubai who was looking for a CTO. So there was the awareness, they had the requirement that they were looking for a CTO. We explored the opportunity together, um, which basically I said, these are the things that I think I can do. Here's things that I've built. Um, here are my weaknesses and what I need to grow into and what I need help on. And then after three days of meeting, I flew out to Dubai to interview for uh, a week or so, and then moved out two weeks later. Um, and, uh, and we decided to work together, which was the last step of the funnel. So to talk about this phase, I, I originally went over to become CTO of the Daily Deals website in the Middle East called Kabone. It was four years old at that point. So like it had customers, it was making money. It wasn't like life or death. Um, and they were looking for a CTO who could uh, improve site performance. So both like speed and, and various optimizations on the site, but then like conversion on checkout and other parts. 
So I had major imposter syndrome. <laughs> I was maybe around like 22 years old and like the people who I was working with who were um, obviously in their late 20s and 30s and 40s were like, like, what the hell is this child doing here? It's like, particularly a CTO, like, have they gone crazy? Um, but fortunately, I was willing to look stupid and fail. And uh, at least if I like totally like messed up, I could go back to Ireland and never talk about it again. But um that, I, I think that was my saving grace. I was willing to look stupid and fail and learn. So I, I had a really intense year of like getting advice and feedback, talking to other people, reading, experimenting, getting coaching, and just like maybe doing some things that others weren't willing to do because it, it was risky. Um, uh, but I made improvements. Fortunately, I was able to add value. So we went to like, uh, instead of deploying once a week to deploying several times a day, improve conversion on site and, and speed and, and some improved processes around like, testing and code reviews um and after one year Kubona was acquired um and that wasn't like a like a big like you know like windfall cash money moment for me I just like was able to now like take maybe like six to nine months out or a year or two go figure out what was next um and uh so then I found myself in this position again I was like okay I've, I've got a little bit of money now I can actually like maybe not work for like yeah six nine months I have to find a new opportunity what's the next thing I'm gonna to work on um so then this is where it became clear that like networking was a, a really unfair advantage. So again, in this awareness part of the funnel, so many times in my, my life and still to this day, I've gotten opportunities, not because I was the best person to work with, just because I was predictable and easy to work with. Um, I learned that like people are really lazy. So when like they need like, you know, it could be a programmer, it could be a, like a consultant or something like they're not going to go through a process and like, you know, spend like four weeks, like finding everything. Some do, but a lot of people in my experience don't, they're not going to go through a big process of like trying to find like the ideal candidate and find everyone. Like often they just want the first person that they, they think of when it comes to mind. They also want to look good and, and they don't want, they want somebody who's trustworthy, somebody who's easy to work with. Um, they want insurance. So like they, they want to minimize risk and, and will hire somebody that they think can deliver, or at least if the person does fail, like everybody else would have made that mistake. Uh, it was clear that like, it was a, it was maybe a good idea. Um, and again, they, they, they want somebody who they think can make them successful in life. So basically in like networking by becoming known and, and by talking about like my skills and the things I was doing, but then also the opportunities I was interested in, even when I had like jobs and stuff, I said, you know, I'm always open to opportunities or thinking um, as maybe on, on the, the thoughts of many people. And, and I learned like networking is basically meeting a load of random people, not knowing if you'll ever see them again. And they're also all playing this game to try and like find somebody who can be useful to them in the future as well. Um, so where networking really kind of came into play was like, I spent this, this one year exploring opportunities after Cabone. Um, I spent a lot of time with my business partner who is the CEO of Cabone, meeting people and making connections, particularly around e-commerce. We kind of got more known for e-commerce in the region from like building uh, and running uh, different companies and, and from uh, like Gabon as the uh, daily deal site. And we explored several opportunities in this time. So I was selling pillows and mattresses online. I had an online flower store for a while, which I think Rosa remembers, which was like, <laughs> I think she might've met me in Dubai and I was like, yeah, it's my new get rich quick scheme, flowers. Everybody needs them. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, seemingly, seemingly not. Um, then like online uh, meal delivery company. I was even selling like iTunes and, uh, and Google Play Store uh, gift cards in Iran. So like everything. And uh, none, of these, none of these companies were successful um, or continued on for, for one reason or another, um, or I didn't continue on with them for one reason or another. Um, and I, I think like you could talk about these different things on, on different expectations or people having different wants or, or whatever um, in a whole nother talk. But at the end of the year, I was basically nearly broke again. I was like, okay, I've just used up like all my savings to explore these different opportunities. I, I guess I'm going to have to get like a job and stop like trying to like role play being an entrepreneur for a while. So um, the, and, and we'll come to how something did just emerge, but again, on this, this opportunity pipeline, and, and let's say like having gotten like those four different opportunities, but despite them not working out for the fifth one, which I'll talk about in a moment that did, I learned that when it comes to opportunities, you have to plant many seeds and you do that by meeting many people and telling them your story and what you can do or what you hope to do. And um, opportunities can take like three to 24 months to appear. 
so um like i was i was at the end of like this year and i was like oh I, like nothing worked out um but the learning is if, if it can take three to 24 months for an opportunity to appear you really have to start early and be consistent in planting those seeds and, and the mental model is for like every 20 conversations or actions you do you might get one lead so that's i use that to, to stop me getting depressed when i'm not like having a lot of success like i know that i have to do yeah 20 things to try and get like one opportunity or one lead um and like i've seen a lot of people who don't plant lots of seeds they haven't got opportunities lined up and when their like current work ends either like expected or unexpected and i've done this a lot as well like you panic and out of fear you just take like the first gig or opportunity that you get even if it's not the best fit and if you just like planted a few more seeds or waited like even like two to four more weeks you could have found something that's a lot fitter and, and that you'd be more successful in so finding the right op opportunity obviously takes time and not everybody has that luxury to do that. Um, so like think some of the things I've done is like prepare leads when I've been at a current job um, by just talking to people and letting people know what my skill set is and, um, and what I hope to do. And then also giving myself like buffer time either through like part-time consulting as I'm looking for a new full-time opportunity or through savings when it's been possible um, knowing that like when this gig ends, I need to be ready to support myself for like four weeks um, to find another gig or something. And again, that, that varies by circumstance. Um, but then talking about, you know, seeds taking a while to, to come up. Um, uh, some people in the, in the region knew us as like the e-commerce guys. And that's mainly because we told them we were the e-commerce guys. I don't know, did any, anybody actually call us that? But we were like, yeah, we're the e-commerce guys. So they, they started to do that. Um, a connection who we knew from two years ago, who we were talking about wanting to do things in, in e-commerce in the region, exploring opportunities, even when we were at Kabon, um, referred us to, to the owners of the largest supermarket chain in Saudi Arabia who wanted to bring their supermarket in line. So we basically explored it with them. We created a plan. We showed off all our e-commerce experience, and then we, we signed a deal with them to do it. And we built a team and launched after five months. And within two years, it was very satisfying as a developer, but we had like over a million app downloads. We're number seven on the app store in the region. We we're like doing grocery deliveries within two hours of ordering over a thousand orders a day and, and processing over a million dollars a month. Um, and it was like, it was really satisfying to do. And, and again, that opportunity took a long time to come about. And at the end of one year when I was almost broke, like it just came at the very last moment. <laughs> but, you know, like history repeats and I find myself burnt out again after, you know, for two years. So for two years, I, I worked really hard chasing success. I didn't sleep a lot. Um, I was really stressed and very paranoid, always worried about if something broke or something went wrong or all these threats to, to like the success of the business. Um, and then eventually I had difficulty with the environments and values. So everybody prioritized growth and like, uh, uh, yeah, growth and, and, and financial success above everything else. And, and that obviously leads to a certain, certain way of decision-making. And then like, won't get into this too deep, but like expectations were made to me, uh, like a carrot over my head. I worked really hard to deliver everything and bring it to a certain place. And then those weren't met. And then all of a sudden, uh, I just found myself like very lost. So I basically got to a point where I no longer liked my life. I didn't want to work. I was so burned out, not a mentally good place. I, I just couldn't even get out of bed. So I decided to like step away and leave and, and try and get that in order. And there's a like typical depending on the workday of breakfast or lunch or dinner um, of like four Red Bull cans and a pack of menthol cigarettes. Fortunately, not smoking anymore, which is, is good. Um, because if, if I did continue to smoke, my mother might kill me before the cigarettes did. But um, So I think this is a, a good point to talk about um, burnout. Uh, burnout develops when you're exposed to chronic stress. That's not necessarily just work. That could be from school. That could be home or whatever. Again, it's, it's nothing new and it wasn't magically invented since Twitter began it's uh there's been like 40 years of research on it both physical and mental um so you're emotionally exhausted you're like physically tired you're cognitively weary um which all means all these are ways of saying that you might not be a lot of fun to be around um and when you're burned out your sense of reality is not correct so when you're burned out like everything looks like a threat everything is terrible and you can't perceive things properly or at least i could never perceive things properly so your quality of life becomes terrible and you may even question like is life worth living and those are definitely thoughts that cross my mind in like the, the very worst of times 
which really isn't a great outcome for like all the ancestors that I have who like ran away from tigers just so that I could like sit here today on zoom like they'd be like what <laughs> why'd you do this to yourself um so burnout can happen really easy it's often the default path you can work yourself very hard particularly if you're passionate or you, you want to um not let down others or, or have kind of many of those things it's, it's it's really easy to happen and, and it happens really easy to me so I have to be like very mindful about it um I found particularly as a software engineer some of the like the the factors for it are if you're juggling multiple jobs or projects at one time and and you you want to keep all your clients happy particularly if they're the guys who like uh are the people who pay you and and you know you're you're if there's multiple of them yeah you're trying to keep everyone happy sometimes i'm, I'm not interested in the thing that i'm working on or, or grow to hate the thing that i'm working on so it can be difficult to bring myself to do it like you don't stop thinking of uh about work problems after like five or six p.m so you can be thinking about them a lot or, or they take over your mind if you are quite into like flow state or working on problems that you can have irregular hours like i really love working until like two three four five a.m on a certain problem if i can just like bang out a feature in one sitting um but obviously that kind of wrecks your sleep um and then uh, other things are like slack and email are terrible for tone and it's really difficult to read emotion so you you don't know if something is a threat or not if somebody's upset you you will put a lot of stories and what people say because you can't hear or see them only read what they're saying um and like i think a lot of software developers are notoriously bad at this i know that i am but like incorrectly estimating uh times to deliver something and then like scrambling to try and ship it on time and save face or look good um so I think breaking that down into two categories and then the parameters within each category is on the mental side, you've got like perceived stress, perceived threats, your perceived lack of time. And if everything is a rush, you don't have time to exercise or, or eat or, or sleep enough. And then this like perceived hopelessness that there's like not a, a way out of a solution. Um, and the, what I find the trick to this is managing these perceptions. So like trying to dig into the stress to see is this warranted success or, or correct success or not are these real threats is somebody actually upset or will they be upset if this happens um perceived lack of time trying to understand actually how much time this is going to take uh how can i budget it so do i actually have time to do something that's good for my mental health like spend time with friends or do some activity that's non-work related and then try and like work very hard to understand how i get myself out of a out of a hole uh, and get rid of that perceived hopelessness then on the like the physical side you obviously have like lack of sleep bad diet um and that's not necessarily like you know eating too much or too little that can be like I, I would have been eating pizza like every night for periods and my blood sugar would go crazy high for two hours and then i'd just crash and feel terrible um lack of exercise a lot of these can lead to inflammation where your body is just trying to like deal with all the bad stuff and that can make you feel obviously physically feel bad um so the way that I've, I've, I've dealt with this is like trying to have a minimum uh, routine that takes all the thinking out. Um, like for example, exercise on like the very worst of the days, I'll at least go for a 30 minute walk, no matter what. Um, even if I have to do a walking call and something work related, um, or with sleep, like, like a minimum SLA of like six hours of sleep or something. Um, but yeah, something just to remove totally that thinking that you have like a minimum physical routine to try and keep that at bay. Um, and there are obviously a, a bunch of resources on this and, and a bunch of causes and recovery, and it looks different in many ways and it's still being understood. But I'm just going to talk about two things that I found particularly helpful for me in managing this. Um, so the first one on, on managing burnout is, is time management um, and really kind of understanding um, where time is or understanding the threats. So you can manage your perceived threats or how much danger you're in, or if you feel that there's no time or lack of time and, and you're kind of procrastinating exercising or sleeping enough or eating properly because you've got no time to do this uh, or you feel overwhelmed because again a lot of burnout can also be mental which then has a physical effect on you because you're so stressed and in fight mode um i do a lot of work on time management to understand my time and try and feel in control and that sense of control keeps can help keep burnout at bay or like reduce the implications of it um so uh, I do this by like managing the, making sure that I've got like appropriate amount of time across each project, or if I'm working on three projects and one project needs more attention for a week, I'll manage expectations with the two other projects to be like, look, I'm not going to have as much time this week, but I'll make up. Uh, I'll talk about expectation management in a moment. 
I try and identify problems ahead of time. So if I know that I'm actually running behind time or I'm going to have like a bottleneck in week three or something, I can communicate them and not live in fear of that for three weeks. Um, I also use time management to spot and schedule opportunities for recovery, a lighter workload. Um, so if I know that I can actually go like maybe at half speed for a few days and just use that time to focus on sleep or routine or eating properly for those three days and getting back in order, um, there's this idea that you have four good, good hours a day. It's like your prefrontal cortex and the most recent part of your brain, uh, uses up so much energy that you only get like four hours of it a day. So I know who's getting my peak time per day. Um, so I'll try and like, instead of doing two intense things in a day, I'll make sure that I do one intense thing. And then like one stupid thing that I can kind of like, like not have too much brain power <laughs> and stress myself over. And then also I can recognize when I'm over limits in my bandwidth. So there's a few different strategies in this. This is time blocking to assign blocks of time per day. There's time tracking, obviously, to see how you're spending your time. I personally, on the first day of every week um, and at the start of every month, will plan out my week and make sure that I achieve everything that I want. Um, and I do a lot of this stuff in Condor as well. It's, it's one of the reasons I um, built it. The other one is expectation management. So the bigger the gap between the client's expectations and reality, the more upset that they're, they're going to be. So if it's like a small gap, they'll be like, they generally won't mind too much. If it's a big gap, they'll probably scream at me on the phone for 10 minutes. And, and that's why I don't work with those people anymore. Um, the, <laughs> so I've learned that if uh, an expectation management, you have to really communicate early and often. And that's also a good way of building trust. Um, I used to hate doing this. I still hate doing it, but I do it is investing time in, in requirements gathering and discovery. Obviously you don't always have that in every project. It's, it's often like a product manager who does that. Um, but I taught myself to get good at, at gathering requirements, making specifications um, so that we could like identify any issues ahead of time. And instead of like week three, finding out that the five week project is actually going to be an eight week project. Um, we address that ahead of time. Um, the other one is like being honest with estimates. It's really painful because you want to, uh, you really want to nail it. Most of the time someone is like, I want to nail this. I want to give them, like tell them the shortest time possible, keep them happy. But like, I've always uh, give myself buffer time now. Um, and, and I typically have a conversation that's something like, I'm going to say it's going to take four weeks, but I might be done in three weeks, but this is optimistic. So when I'm a weekend, I'll tell you if it's still three or four weeks. Um, I try and find problems early and, and communicate them early, listen to the impact. And then I spend a lot of time managing clients as well. So a lot of clients aren't good at managing themselves or managing other people. So I have regular meetings, maybe every week or every two weeks, ask them for feedback, how they're finding me, if there's any early issues or anything they're concerned about. There's no surprises from my side or their side. And sometimes like between 10 to 20% of my time is managing expectations. And again, a lot of this is just to remove the sense of like threat or, or lack of time pressure or hopelessness um, and just remove the fear um, that often results in my, my burnout. Um, and I've also learned that like time isn't value. So like, I'm very, uh, I'm very good about um, making sure that I, I carve out time for me. And, and often the time the client doesn't know, like sometimes the thing that might take a day, they, they think will take five days. Sometimes they, uh, <laughs> the thing that they take, think might take five days or, or might think takes one day is, is five days. Um, so I, I, I think you, you use that to your advantage to make sure that you can look after yourself and that you be successful. And when you're successful, they're successful theoretically. <laughs> um, so uh, this then just talking about after burning out in the Middle East and, and dealing with all that, I spent time digesting data points from all those years. I had a lot of experiences, worked with lots of different people, and just wanted to see how I, I felt about those values. I figured out what was important to me and what I liked and didn't like about that whole experience. So like avoiding burnout was important to me. It actually turns out that like financial and material success wasn't that important for me. If I'd made lots of money, if I made no money, I'd probably be not doing very different things uh, or still like the same things. And, and most importantly, also not like chase rewards that the, the thing that I worked on every day was important for me to enjoy whether or not it was successful or not, um, but I enjoyed the work. So I knew I wanted to build something next and I, I didn't know what, but I had a pretty good idea of until I knew what I wanted to build, I wanted uh, two things. Uh, to see how more tech companies worked uh, and get more exposure to marketing, uh, obviously the technology stack, their financials and so on, but then also have time and flexibility to think about my next project. So again, I talked to many people, said that this is the thing that I was looking for, this is my skill set, asked them who I should talk to, 
And then somebody I knew from nine years ago, I, uh, I connected with again, and they offered me a role at a private equity firm called Xenon, which was based between Tokyo and San Francisco. Basically, uh, this private equity firm, they owned like 10 software as a service companies. I spent each time, I spent time with each company as like a mercenary CTO, helping them uh, build features or solve tech problems. I um, would also perform due diligence on companies that they, they wanted to buy um, and, and would help like determine how we'd run them. And I think through this experience, I got to see how many different parts of the company work. So again, not just technology, but their legals, their marketing, and so on. Eventually, after a certain point, I, I felt that I gained all the experience that I wanted out of it and was ready to move on. And towards the end of that uh, time at Xenon, I met uh, the Tokyo Mate, well, who'd become my Tokyo Mate co-founders, um, and got more confidence and conviction in wanting to build Conjure because I'd been thinking about it for maybe a year, year and a half at that point and, and playing around with different ideas. Um, so as I just, as I talk about in a moment, about the beginning of Tokyo Mate and the beginning of Conjure, I'll talk about this transition point now from software engineer to, to founder and some notes on it. So I think, you know, there's this expression um, that like startups or experiments to find sustainable business models. So like the main things that you're looking for are proof, uh, feedback and learnings around the idea that you have. And this isn't necessary like building the product day one or something. This could be like building landing pages to see if it actually interests people, talking to users and potential clients, like if they'd, if they'd even use it before you even do get in it. Um, most of the challenge in startups are value related. They're not technical. And again, this, this you know, depends on the startup. Um, like if you're trying to build something like a uh, hosting or, or solve like a technical challenge or something like obviously a landing page isn't going to cut it but um, this is a common thread that I found in startups I've worked on but like you can build something really cool but if it only gives you value and doesn't give them value um, or it doesn't give them the right type of value they won't use it you have to avoid over engineering and being too opinionated early on because the requirements might change, or once you get some customers, you can find out that they use it in a different way, or it's something use it's something that you didn't anticipate. Um, again, in over avoid, avoiding over engineering, it's good to do the thing that works for the moment if it's even a not super scalable and using uh, using known technology. So it can be really tempted to use a when building a startup as an opportunity to also learn a new language or stack that you've wanted to 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 learn to keep it fun and novel. But then you spend a bunch of time like fighting technology problems instead of like addressing value problems or research. Um, and I think for some of these reasons, like people who like to code can like really hurt or hate the early stage of building a startup because it's not some of the fun like coding or technical challenges, it's, it's, it's value related. And again, this depends on the value of the startup or, or what your definition of success is. But kind of speaking on that, that, there's been two approaches to building companies or startups um, that I've seen and, and that I've done. The first one is the scientist approach. So it's, uh, it's building something when you have an idea, it's taking feedback on the thing that you've built and then iterating based on that feedback. So your, pro your ideas might come from problems or other people's problems or space you're interested in, or maybe you've got a co-founder who spent like 10, 20 years working in that space and they know all the problems and opportunities. You're defining your roadmap and backlog based on like interviewing potential users and what they want. You're building a minimum viable product, like the, 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 their bare minimum, not minimum quality, but the bare minimum to give value. And you're taking feedback and improving the product and direction based on that feedback or completely change direction. And I think of a few, like two examples of companies that did this were Segment, they, they, the, the billion dollar data pipeline or data processing company that was uh, acquired by Twilio some time ago, like they started as classroom software. And they, um, they did that for like a year or two and then they pivoted to analytics and then they found out that people actually liked when they could send their data to different destinations based on this like JavaScript snippet that they wrote. So they just kept on working based off feedback. Slack actually started off as a video game called Glitch, I believe was the name of it. And then they had built this chat. The, the video game wasn't really working out. They had built this like internal chat on the side and that turned out to be the thing. So they just totally switched directions. Um, so that's the, the kind of scientific approach where you build something, you take feedback, you iterate. The other approach, uh, and, and Tokyo Made has been taking the scientist approach, which I'll talk about in a moment. But we have an idea of, of how people should, should work and do business in Japan and, and live. And we want to build tools to support that. And, and we're taking those learnings and experimenting. The artist approach is something I've been taking with Conjure, which is you have a vision for something that you want to see in the world. 
something that gives you value. It doesn't matter if other people don't use it or it doesn't give other people value. It's, it gives you value and it's something you want. Um, you're optimizing for creation, not revenue. So it doesn't matter if it doesn't make a lot of money. Uh, you just want it to give value and to exist. And you don't really care how long it takes. You're not under pressure to have it built in a certain time to please like investors or something. Some examples of these projects are like GitHub started off as a weekend project. Tailwind began as like a bunch of CSS utilities uh, for the creator his own projects. MailChimp was uh, a tool for the founder's own uh, web design agency. Um, so again, it, it's uh, your definition of success with the, sci the scientist approach is, is other people's interpretations, but your definition of success as the artist approach is your own uh, perception. Um, and again, there's, there's a few bunch of ways. I, I know that we're like, we're coming to the end and coming to Q and A time. The, uh, I begin to see the panic on, on Rose's face. Uh, <laughs> at least in this tiny, I don't know, whatever, like 400 by 300 pixel box on my screen. Um, the, uh, so uh, the transition, like, yeah, you could do it as a side project. Not every business needs to raise money or, or be big. Most startups fail. So if it's a side project, then you've kind of limited the damage. Um, you can wait until you're confident to go full time, but the downside is that you're limiting focus and you need to pace yourself. So if you do something full time, it might take three months. If it's part time, it could take six months or nine months. Um, and then the full time approach is that you get to give your full focus, but then you've got pressure to fund fundraise and make money early on. Um, and you can get this stuck in this fundraising trap where you know, you're, you're raising money every six or 12 or 18. Well, yeah, probably like six or 12, the, the trap would be raising money every like 16 or sorry, six or 12 months. Um, and spending a lot of time focused on raising and trying to grow rather than building the, the product. And it's a, a different set of parameters. So anyway, the thing that I've learned is that you have to be patient and you have to be willing to, to work on something for like three to three months to two years without validation just to give it time to, to collect learnings and improve the product and get feedback and, and let it breathe. And you also have to give yourself time as an entrepreneur to, to uh, improve and learn um, because it is a skill set and it is a, a bunch of learnings. Um, so, uh, oh, you going back. So yeah, I think just to kind of come to the end about things that are going on now in my life, um, during that time at Xenon, I, the, the private equity firm, I kept networking. I just kept on saying to people, like, I want to start something again in the future. I'm open to exploring ideas. I met Jay, who had started and sold a business in Japan. He knew all the pain points about doing business in Japan and living in Japan, being there for 20 years. I thought I'd work, like working with Jay. Um, I, I felt that he knew this problem set really deeply. So as deeply as I knew building a uh, building a web application. He knew uh, deeply the, uh, the experience of, of doing business in Japan. Um, so we made a, like a fake website, um, just like a landing page that we threw up. We ran some ads and Google targeted people who were searching like virtual mail, Japan, uh, tax return, Japan, visas, Japan, see if anyone would click on the ads and land on the landing page. And then we also contacted some people we thought would be potential customers on LinkedIn based on their profile and ask them like, would you be interested in this service? And through that positive response, we got confidence and we went ahead and built Tokimate then. We got customers, we raised funding and, and hired people and, and did that whole thing. Um, and that was a very scientific approach where we, we tested out our, our theory ahead of time. Um, and it came about because I just kept on, again, that, that pipeline thing, I, I put awareness out there and let people knew that I was interested in, in building something again. The Conjure thing was during my time at, at Xenon, I research, was researching habits, uh, happiness and life satisfaction. I'd also built two other systems just to experiment with like the space and, and if I was to build something in it. And I, I really wanted to build a system that could help me get the most out of life. That was like the big 10, 20 year vision. Um, and I think my learning after like, you know, working in, in nonprofits and for profits and different companies and, and with different people. So after all these experiences, the the thing that gave me most joy in life was, was helping others and seeing others improve in their life. And I kind of felt that, that was the thing that I would like to do for the rest of my life. Um, so again, ask me in 10 years, that could change, but right now that feels like the thing that I want to do for the rest of my life. So I built two systems before building Conjure to play with ideas. Um, I got the learnings and confidence and formed a vision of how it should, uh, 
look. And then I also mentally committed to working on it for up to two years, even if nobody else used it, because I knew that it would be working for a long time. There's a bunch of times I would build something a weekend and, you know, by month three, it wasn't making a thousand dollars a month. And I'd be like, oh, it's a total failure. It'll never work. So I said, okay, it's going to take like two years to, um, to, to be representative of what I want to see in the world. So right now it's been 16 months of development, again, alone and bootstrapped. I've within Conjure itself tracked uh, just under 2000 hours, uh, 1,982 hours of development. Um, I have, uh, I'm, I'm really careful about saying that in case people think that it sucks, but that's how much time I've tracked. And that was like month, like two or three when time tracking was like shipped. Um, I've got paying customers. Uh, some people have used it every day for the last few months. So some people think above do find it useful and I'm really excited for the future of it. So I think wrapping up, um, success and happiness look different to different people at different times in their life. Everybody has their own path. The times that I've been following it, someone else's path is the time that I've been most unhappy. Um, I've tried to maximize opportunities to follow my own path through being intentional, defining what I want. If I don't know what I want, I, I try and go figure that out. Networking and building a funnel. I've tried to collect a lot of data to see what makes me feel happy and fulfilled. Um, I have to use strategies to, to manage myself and manage burnout and think about it because it happens by default to me. Um, and I do regularly reflect on my current definition of success. And that definition has changed like four or five times over the last yeah, 15 years of my life. Um, and I adjust my path accordingly. And to kind of summarize that up as an algorithm, it's define your current versions of success. It's find opportunities to achieve that success. Do that opportunity for a while then check in if it's six months, if it's 12 months or two years afterwards to see if you still feel successful. If you do, great, continue on. If not, you go back to step one. Um, and I think with that, I wish you all to be successful and health, wealth, and happiness and all the, the good things. Um, I don't know if we want to uh, ask some questions. You can ask me what I've been doing for 1,900 hours because <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, the things that I have seen have been amazing. So um, thank you, James, for that. That was amazing. I uh, This is obviously the second time uh, I've heard this and also talked loads about what this is going to be about. And I just feel like I'm soaking in loads myself, especially about my four good hours a day. I'm thinking about who actually gets to use those. Um, so we have lots of questions. I want to just dive in and not rattle on myself. Uh, I think while we're on Conjure, Peter's question is actually great. Uh, he's answered a little quote, but a question about, you know, laziness can creep in with developers. You start something and your local dev, as you said, like maybe doing a weekend project and then there's just that bit of fizzle out. And so how do you keep motivation, especially like the past kind of two years you've been working on Conjure, all those 1800 yeah. hours and what there's... what's kept you going <laughs> <laughs> i mean and it always hasn't been that way i've got so many zombie uh, github repos that's uh I, which i'm like oh yeah that, that was a thing once upon a time um i think that it uh it, trying to that question of like what can i work on for up to two years um without anybody else using it or any validation was like a good question to ask if i really wanted to do that thing enough um not every, you don't have to work on some projects forever. Like sometimes the, the purpose of a project is just to learn a new language or explore something. So it doesn't have to necessarily be shipped for you to get a lot of value from it. Um, I think for particularly for Conjure, it helps that I had built two things before this to try and solve the same problem or explore the space. So I had a much better idea of what I wanted. It's something that I use every day and will spend like maybe one hour in a day, two hours a day in, because it's open in one, uh, in one tab and I constantly use. So I kind of have to use it for my own sake. So that helps a lot. Um, and uh, yeah, like I, I also give myself permission that if I, if I don't feel good, I always do at least like a minute a day. That's actually my rule in it to do, in the worst case, one minute a day to keep a, a streak. And I've worked on it something now for like 300 and, and something odd days in a row on Saturdays and Sundays, but at worst case, one minute a day. Um, but I do give myself permission to, to take breaks or like work on a different set of features if I'm feeling burnt out in one thing. So because it's on like iOS, Android, web, and front end, back end, and API, there's plenty of things to, 
to <laughs> switch between. I think the best uh, the best comment I saw on Twitter last week when you went you went live was, "Oh, Clubhouse has X amount in funding, and they don't have an iOS app. What's James Weldon possibly doing?" Like, <laughs> <laughs> amazing. Yeah. Um, no, I think that's really, really important, like keeping the motivation and just, as you said, like that artistry of point, uh, like the fact that you're a user of what you're building is keeping you going. And I think another kind of broad question that we, we have got a lot of is like advice around being a self-taught developer, um, getting started as a software engineer, going into DevOps, all different things. I guess, what, what would your advice be? From that kind of technical perspective of thinking about you've taught yourself a lot of languages as you said you're a full stack developer what does that look like what advice would you give someone who's also self-taught yeah to keep going? um the and and i do get like a, a lot of imposter syndrome as well on it so like it took a <clears throat> i think like like i won't say which but like there are definitely some like uh function names and languages that I was mispronouncing 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 for years until somebody was like what like that's so um the uh yeah I, I think in like self-learning i've just spent a lot of time like looking at different code bases and different um uh i guess different projects to try and get a better idea of of like what does a good code base look like or how do different people do things or like actually how bad can something be for it to still be valuable to people so like most days like i do look at like the weekly um monthly uh, weekly and month daily weekly and monthly trending repos on github and we'll just like flick through or something across like the, the languages that i mentioned in like typescript or go or, or ruby um and looking at these different projects gives me a, a better idea i've also like just followed a bunch of tutorials or done courses on udemy like when i was learning go um that was it and just keep the stakes high just to like play around or like once i get the value out of a project by playing i'll, I'll just abandon it if it's uh, no longer valuable to me um but I, I think definitely by by following tutorials or building different projects or even things for for your own use, um, that's how I've learned. And then of course when I've I've gone and, and worked in a in a corporate setting, like I've shadowed people, I've asked people why they've done, and like it's so difficult to be willing to look stupid. Like honestly, if if I was going to put like any like thing on my LinkedIn, it would be like my I professionally look stupid. Um, but that like that's been the fastest way that I've, I've learned, and that's not easy. Like you know and. and a lot, a lot of people just feel uncomfortable doing it. Um, but like, it was the only way when I'd have like anxiety about like people who do code reviews and they'd be like, oh, this code sucks. So like, really you'd structure it like that and, uh, or something. Um, it was the only way to get past it. And and that was how I got rid of a, a lot of fear was working with other people or, or just, yeah, willing to look stupid. Yeah, actually so someone has asked as well, like what, what do you do? What can you do to overcome that rejection? So like maybe what did you learn early on in this willingness to look stupid, right? Whether that's dress up as a clown costume or have your code <laughs> demolished uh, on a PR. Yeah. Um, and especially uh, someone's asking from the perspective of like not having a university degree, so not feeling maybe like th that imposter syndrome is creeping in to a degree. What, what do you think that's helped you to overcome maybe elements of rejection in that opportunity pipeline or in fact, kind of technical issues that you've wanted to learn more about? Yeah. I found with um, maybe like with working with others when I have like a client or boss or something, maybe I'm like, let's just say that particularly the university degree thing, like the way that I've gotten around that is having projects that I can point to. Like, even if they're not like a bunch of people don't use them, if I'm like, here's a e-commerce store that runs, might not have any customers, but it can still like do everything. You can check out and pay and whatever. But it, by the fact that I have projects that I've made, which is kind of close to the thing that they want, that like pseudos any want for a degree or something, because I've already shown them that I can deliver the thing exactly that they want. Um, like the, the the college degree thing in a lot of cases is like a parameter to de-risk or it's just a part of a funnel. Um, so I, I think that that's been like a, a thing with a, a college degree that I, I've just shown projects that exist that I've done. Um, I think on the... Uh, what was the first part of, uh, I guess like managing rejection or, um, oh, yeah. yeah, getting, getting over the, the speed bumps that inevitably come right in life. Yeah. It's, it's incremental. Like it's not a, it's, you can't go from like zero to hundred day one. Um, like the, uh, like I'd even feel stressed, like going into public business and asking if I can use the bathroom because I'd be like, oh, I'm not a customer. Can I just use this bathroom or like go into this like hotel or something and ask? So I'd have to. And you're uh, Irish and that's like, you know, a typical thing that we would do here. Oh yeah, the, the beer, <laughs> yeah. 
So, <laughs> yeah, there's, really, I mean, even like to challenge myself one or two times, I've gone into a hotel and asked if I could use a bathroom if I didn't have to just to be like, yes, I did it. Um, no, but it's, a, it's an incremental thing. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a journey. There's no like, you know, one thing that you learn and, and it stops, but I've learned that like the times that I've grown fastest is the times that I've, uh, face rejection i've learned that like other people really don't care they forget like everybody has their own problems so if you look stupid like they're not going to remember a like maybe by the end of the day definitely not the end of the week or something um i generally keep the like the stakes high as well like if i do something stupid it doesn't mean that i'm a stupid person it just means that i didn't have that experience or that learning at that time there's no other way and you can you can go as fast or as slow as you want um so like I've incrementally like shared my work or, or code online or something like you don't have to open source a big project or show off a big project to begin with. If you feel that it's going to be scrutinized, they'll find something like you just start off with like small gists and GitHub or small snippets or something. Um, but for sure, I, I think the thing that I've always remembered is like I've grown and gotten success through failure and through rejection. And by knowing that it will take like 20 failures to get one bit of success. And I'm like, okay, let's get these, get these 20 failures out of the way. Cause I, I want that success. Yeah. Fail fast. That's nice. Yeah. Okay. One last question, James, I'm conscious we're coming to time, but I think it's a really good one from, uh, from Michael, which is after hearing all the authentic storytelling you've been telling us about all the pain points, the ups and downs of your journey so far. Um, is there anything you would do differently with your career? If you had the chance, you know, there, there's a, this part of me where I could go back and be like, yeah, I could do that differently or something, but I, I'm generally quite like happy with the, the learnings that I've had in life around what I like. I also like having those, those experiences or like the times that really sucked or like I've been, I've been at the edge because that's really set like the, the floor um, and I have a better appreciation. So like, I, I don't think I would, I would change anything. That's really cliche to say. I definitely could opt if I had to go through it like a second time round, I feel like, oh yeah, I'm not making that same mistake. And I already got that learning, but I'm quite thankful for the, the learnings and the highs and the lows um, where I'm at now in life. That's great, James. Um, well, thank you. Uh, we are at time. And um, thank you to everyone. There was a lot of questions and answers and we didn't get through them all, but I think hopefully we got broad strokes. And uh, I know that I really appreciated your talk, Jim. So thank you so much for putting it together and sharing it with us. Um, and thank you everyone for joining. Oh, Oscar's setting off an alarm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank that's, you, my, Rosa, that's, my, that's my alarm to eat, actually, if we want to talk about it. I, another thing in my sleep is I'm so bad. I eat at the same time, uh, eat lunch and dinner at the same time every day. And I have to set that alarm so I remember to eat in time because that like affects my sleep and everything. So that's Managing why I... the top tip to take away from this talk <laughs> is set an alarm and you need to eat or drink water or sleep. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, it, maybe everyone isn't as bad as me, but. <laughs> I think we got, we got some other people doing the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Awesome. Well, thanks, James. Thanks, Rosa. See you. Thank you.